can't agree on how to pronounce the name of this pH buffer, but they can agree that it's a goods buffer. But is it a good buffer for your experiment and how do you use it and things like this? Let's take a look. Sorry for all the puns, but I couldn't resist this goods one. Norman Good and his colleagues figured out this list of 20 different buffers, so these pH stabilizers, that were good for biological and biochemical research for various reasons, like they were water soluble and they weren't toxic and they didn't interfere with various processes, and they had a buffering range so they could maintain the pH in a range that was around physiological or bodily conditions, so somewhere around the 7, 7.4 range. And so these became known as goods buffers. They were started with this 1966 paper, and then there was another paper in 1972 and 1980. And altogether, you get this list of 20 goods buffers. And one of them is going to be this heaps or heapies. People pronounce it different ways. And we will take a look at it in detail. So this is just an overview and we'll go into these things um, in more detail, but basically it has a useful buffering range of about 6.8 to 8.2. So it'll you can prepare it so that it'll maintain a pH somewhere between those values. Um, depending on how you prepare it, you can say make it so that it'll buffer at seven or buffer at 7.6. It all depends on how you start things out in terms of the amount of the acid and the conjugate base. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, we'll also talk about how it has a lower temperature dependence than Tris, which is another common buffer we use. It has low mi metal binding ability, and it's useful for various cell culture purposes because it's not going to be dependent on the carbon dioxide, like bicarbonate buffers that we often use in cell culture. So now let's look in more detail at these individual things. So first off, let's review what a buffer is, or a pH buffer in, um, in this case. This is going to be a chemical that can act as both an acid and a base. Um, so basically, an acid is something that donates a proton, and a base is something that takes a proton. And pH is a measure of the free protons that are available in order to take. And so if you have a molecule that can give up a proton, we call it an acid. And if you have a molecule that can take a proton, we call it a base. And now what you might be realizing is that once something gives up, an gives up a proton, so once it acts as an acid, well, now it can act as a base. So an acid and a base are just flip sides of the same coin. And so we can call these the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. And in the case of heaps, this would be our conjugate acid this form that's that's protonated at this hydrogen and not protonated at this um, at the sulfate group. And then what we have is if we raise the pH, we lower the free protons available. Now that nitrogen is going to get um, deprotonated. And so you end up with this um, this negatively charged net negatively charged molecule. And this would be the conjugate base of this. So the acid has a proton it can give up. This becomes the conjugate base. In this acid form, this is, you can actually see this is what we call Zwitter ionic. So it's neutral overall, but it has a positively charged part and a negatively charged part. So often you'll see heaps referred to as a Zwitter ionic buffer. So if you go below the pKa of an acid, basically, or a bit. So if you go below the pKa, basically this means that it's mostly going to be in its conjugate acid form. And if you go, above the pKa, you're mostly going to be in the conjugate base form. And this is because the pH is a measure of those free proton availabilities, but it's a negative log scale, which means that the more protons you have, the lower the pH, the more acidic. So if you're in an environment where there's a lot of protons available, then things are going to have be bound to those protons. And so you're gonna be mostly in this conjugate acid form that has the potential to give up a proton. And so if we're below the pKa, so if we're below the pH at which half of it is protonated, more than half of it is going to be protonated. So you're gonna be in this Witter ionic acid form. And if you're above the pKa, you're gonna be mostly in this net, um, in this net negative, um, alkyl, this um, conjugate base form. And so you're going to see this at high pH where you have, or basic alkaline conditions and this at the lower pH or acidic conditions. 
And later we'll talk about how you can actually prepare buffers of heaps by basically uh, dissolving. Typically what you do is you dissolve this free acid form and then you adjust the pH by adding base, helping sop up some of those protons, taking them from this nitrogen and giving you more of this. And so this by this way, you're able to kind of start out with whatever ratio of acid and base that you want in order to maintain the pH where you want. And so there's this thing called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which I go into in another post. But basically, it tells you that the ratio of the acid and the base that you start with is going to therefore dictate what the pH will be held at, at least in, unless you kind of exhaust the buffering capacity. And so we'll talk more about preparing these, these solutions later. But let's get back to why we might want to use it. One of the reasons is it has a lower temperature dependence than Tris. And so I mentioned Tris before. This is another one that we commonly use in um, biochemistry and molecular biology. It's useful for um, several reasons, but one of them is that um, it has a, or a buffering range that we like. It has a peak of A that's slightly higher than that of PEEP. So if we want something closer to a pH of 8, Tris can be a good, good one for this. And there's some other reasons like various things that it doesn't react with. Um, but there are also some downsides, and one of them is that Tris has a high de temperature dependence. And so you can see that as you go to a higher temperature, basically what's going to happen is that the solution is going to acidify. So those protons are going to be given up more easily, and your the pH is going to lower. So if you were to, say, prepare your buffer at 20 degrees Celsius and then use it in a reaction at 37 degrees Celsius, well, now your pH is going to be lower than you thought that it should be. With heaps, this is going to be less of a change. Another, um, So there are also some other benefits and disadvantages of every buffer. And so we talked about temperature of TRIS, um, pH, the pH dependence of TRIS and how it's lower with heaps. Um, it keeps does, however, react with depth C, and there are some other things. So basically, it, yeah, just take a look. I do, there are reasons why different buffers might be used for different specific things, but typically one of the key places that you'll start is by looking at that pH, that buffering range, seeing what has a buffering range that is useful for you, um, seeing if there are anything like glycine groups or amine, group, amine groups or things like this that might interfere with whatever experiments you want to do. And just look at what people typically use in the sorts of reactions that you are looking at to make sure that it'll be compatible. One thing um, that's good about heaps um, is that it has low metal binding, so it's safe to use for with things like metal dependent proteins. There are some buffers that act as chelators, so they kind of bite down on or and hide metals, such as like phosphate and citrate containing buffers can do that. But heaps isn't going to have that metal binding, and so that that can be useful if you need to be, if you need to be cautious about that. It can also be useful for cell culture, so to, like mammalian cell culture especially when you're working outside of carbon dioxide controlled incubators. So typically when we're working with cell culture, so when we're growing cells in like these dishes or sometimes flasks and things like this, we're working in a carbon dioxide controlled chamber, like an incubator, but then we have to take, or we're not working in there, we're growing them in there. But when we actually work with them, we take them out of that incubator and we work with them in like a tissue culture hood. And when we're doing that, now we don't have that carbon dioxide control. And why this matters is because this carbon dioxide is needed in order to keep the pH stable in these solutions if those solutions rely on a bicarbonate based buffer system. So these off these the media or the like food that we're growing these cells in is often uses a bicarbonate based system because that's what our bodies use to buffer the pH. And this bicarbonate system, basically it relies on the fact that carbon dioxide in the air um, and then in our blood, it basically, it, when it dissolves in our blood, you get carbonic acid, um, which can then associate in, in, it can then give up a proton to give you bicarbonate. And you get this buffering system where you have this bicarbonate carbonic acid buffering system. And so if you add more carbon dioxide, well, now you're going to end up with things being more acidic. And if you take away carbon dioxide, 
well, now things are going to be more basic. And so what happens is if you take, when we have this carbon dioxide control in our shaker or, or in our incubator, we typically have it at like five or 8% carbon dioxide, which is a lot higher than the carbon dioxide in air, which is more like 0.3%. And so if we take things out of the incubator, well, now our carbon dioxide is going to be a lot lower, which means that we're going to have it be, our solution is going to become more basic. And if our solution becomes more basic, well, this might interfere with whatever we're trying to do. Um, it might cause things to change in the cells. And so we, if we don't want this to happen, what we can do is we can add heaps to the buffer. Um, and this can basically then serve as a sort of extra layer of protection for when you're working outside of that carbon dioxide control. Typically, you don't just use heaps, though. You typically, often people add it to a solution that contains this bicarbonate buffer for reasons like not having to then add as much heaps because it can be toxic at high concentrations. Um, it can um, affect some cell processes potentially, and it can form oxidation products that can be toxic to cells, so you want to keep it protected from light. But people often add heaps. Um, and so one way that you could see if your culture is kind of like the pH is changing is that you typically add the phenol red dye. Um, and basically what this happens is that as this dye becomes more acidic, it's going to get oranger. And after it becomes more basic, it's going to get purplier. And so if you see your media become kind of purpley, this might be happening if you're keeping it out of the incubator too long. And that might be a sign that maybe you need to add a second layer of protection. Maybe you need to add some heaps. And so that's one of the reasons why you might use heaps would be for cell culture purposes. But we also use it for a lot of purposes that have nothing to do with cell culture because of the various few useful properties. So let's talk really quickly more in detail about how we actually make it. So this is just from like gold bio. And then I added some notes. So basically, when we look at heaps, it has a molecular weight of 238.3 grams per mole and much more on concentrations and things in another post. But basically, if we want a one molar solution of heaps, we would need to dissolve 238.3 grams in one liter of, of media so or of water. So if we wanted a solution that was like 500 mils, we just divide that by two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we were to just dissolve heaps in water, we would get a solution that was not the pH that we wanted. Typically, we start with this free, well, this is like the free acid form. So basically, because it's witter ionic, it's neutral, it doesn't need to have a counter ion hanging out with it. But at its basic form, where it's ne negative charged, well, here we typically get it as a salt. So you might get like heap sodium, um, sodium. Um, it's, so it's like in the salt form with the sodium ion that would be neutralizing it. And if you had like heaps, if you had heaps, potassium heaps, it would have a potassium counter ion that was serving as the neutralizer. And so this is what you get. Basically, a salt is going to be a plus thing, so a cation, and a minus thing, an anion. And so the counter ion um, in this case could be sodium or it could be potassium. And so that would be your, your base form, your salt base. But so you can start with that, but typically you start with this free acid form. And what's going to happen is that as you dissolve this in water, it's going to deprotonate. Some of it's going to deprotonate and you're going to end up with an acidic solution. And so then you're going to have to add base. For a buffer to be helpful, it needs to have high, it has to have fairly equal concentrations of the acid and the base form so that it can give and take protons with more added to the system or more taken away from the system. And that's how it's able to serve as a buffer. So you don't want to just have all the acid form. So you have to add in some of the, some base in order to get some of that base form. And so the base that you add is often going to be sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. And what you're going to do is you weigh, you weigh out the amount that you need to get the concentration that you want, and then you basically adjust the pH. So when you're doing the dissolving, you dissolve it in a lower volume than you're actually going to need. Especially in the case of like heaps, you're gonna need to add a lot of the base. So make sure you leave plenty of space to do that pH adjustment. And then you do that pH adjustment, and then you adjust your volume to the final volume that you want.
the, depending on what pH you're going for, for the desired pH, remember that's going to depend on how much of the acid and base forms you start out with. And so in order to start out with more of the base form, what you can do is you can add more, add more base, so add more sodium hydroxide or add more potassium hydroxide, or you can actually start with some of the salt with the salt um, form and then some of the acid form and kind of mix those to get the head start going on, going into it. You can do the pH adjustment with either like a highly concentrated acid or highly concentrated base solution. So that'd be your NaOH or your KOH, um, but it's going to take a lot. So you can see that this is for hundred milliliters of um, solution. So if you wanted a pH of 7.6, they're saying you have to add 33 milliliters of this NaOH, which is a lot of NaOH. So what I typically do is I've done doing, and that's just a um, hundred milliliters. So if I wanted to do a higher amount of like a higher volume, typically what I do is I start with sodium hydroxide or I start with potassium hydroxide pellets. So like a solid form rather than the liquid solution. And then when I get closer to the pH I want, I start adding it, the solution drop wise. And this is going to save you from having to make a lot, a lot, a lot of that concentrated base solution and then use it all up. And the next time you need to make a buffer, you don't have any left. So starting with the solid can be helpful in that case. And hope that helps you understand the heaps, um, how to make it, how to use it, why to use it. And now I'm gonna go make some.